Almighty God, we thank you because of the example and the illustration that we have from the life of Daniel. Thank you, Lord, because you've shown us this great prophet intercessor. And we're praying that you'll make intercessors out of every one of us in Jesus' name. That, Lord, as we pray and hold up, hold up our nation and land before you, you'll heal our land in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you touch our families. You revive our church. And through the prayers of everyone united in heart together, Lord, we pray that something great, something wonderful, marvelous, a great revival you'll bring upon every soul and every local church and the whole church in Jesus' name. Lord, it is a prayer as well as the prayer of Daniel and the prayer of Moses and the prayer of Elijah and the prayer of the rest of the people of Paul the Apostle that you'll heal this land in Jesus' name. All that we need to do, turning away from our wickedness and sin as a nation, that we need to do to please you. Lord, we pray you help us as a church to start and to lead the way so that this land will be healed in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We are looking at a very important subject which is fervent prayer or fervent intercession for the nation's restoration. We're looking at Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, we're reading from verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Hasuerus, of the siege of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books, the number of the years whereof the words of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations and the captivity of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments, we have seen, and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from the precepts and from thy judgments. In verse 6, neither have we akinj unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake. In, the, in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. As at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou was driven them because of their, trans of their transpires, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confession of faith, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God, to walk in his laws, which is set before us by his servants, his prophets. In verse 11, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is, up, is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Yet made not we our prayer before the Lord our God, 
that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore, as the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people from forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten thee renowned, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. There we have the intercession of the prayer of Daniel as a prayed for the nation Israel, the people of Judah, that God will have mercy and return them from captivity so that they will go back to their land. As we look at this chapter, it is very instructive because it gives us the account of Daniel's prayer for the restoration of Judah from captivity. Daniel was not a full-time prophet, yet his intercessory prayer and prophetic ministry was as effective as that of any other prophet of his day. If you look at the last verse of chapter 8, looking at chapter 8, verse 27, And I, Daniel, fainted, and was six certain days afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. The Lord had showed him a spectacular vision, and because of the revelation that he had in that vision, he said the cogitations of his heart, the meditation, the thoughts, and the consideration of his heart. Because of those things that he saw, it troubled him very much. And he said it was six certain days because of the revelation and because of the vision. But then he said, afterward, after getting over the difficulty and that challenge, after getting over all the pressure and the pain and the conflict he had in his soul, in his mind, because of that revelation, he said, then I rose up and I did the king's business, which tells us was still in service. And yet he had time to study the word of God. He had time to be able to see that the solutions of Judah, the captivity of Judah, must be coming to an end at the end of 70 years. Come to Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, that is, of the reign of Darius, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. He didn't allow the business of the day or the work he had to do in the king's palace to hinder him from searching the word, searching the book, and finding out what God had determined and decided for the people of Judah who were at this time in captivity. The discoveries of his study drove him to prayer. That's the reason why he said in the next verse, that's in verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and by supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes because of what he had studied and because of what he learned. Because of that, he knew I must do something and I must present my supplication before the Lord. What a great lesson we're learning from Daniel that when you study the word of God and you study the word and you go from verse to verse and chapter to chapter, from one part of the Bible to the other, and then you see what the Lord is saying. You hear his word, you learn his word, you study his word. That should lead you and drive you to prayer. In fact, Habakkuk says in chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3, 
looking at verse 2, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. Oh Lord, I have heard thy speech, just like you are hearing now. And just like Daniel saw, like Daniel studied, like Daniel read, like Daniel heard, I've heard thy word. And then when he said, he said that, I was afraid. I had your word and brought some fear into me, the fear of God. That's a holy fear, a sacred fear. Oh Lord, revive thy word in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. The study that he had and what he heard and what he saw, what he received from the Lord, drove him to prayer. And the same thing should be the lesson we learn and the things that we actually do. That because of what we learn, because of what we understand and because of what we see in the word of god when we study the word of god that will lead us real praying to seeking the face of the lord that what we read in the word and what we study in the word will become part of our lives and what's part of our lives will be able to make use of and then we pray according to the word we have learned according to the word we have studied and then god will answer our prayers in jesus name as we look at daniel he combined a secular work and a spiritual ministry effectively and advantageously for the progress of the kingdom of God. I'm sure you remember Daniel as we look at Daniel chapter 6. You'll see that in his secular work was honest, was faithful, he had integrity and he could be depended upon and yet he didn't, he wasn't slack in his prayer life, in his ministerial life, in his prophetic life. He was able to combine both sides together. You're looking at Daniel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Daniel chapter 6 verse 1. He pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three precedents of whom Daniel was forced. That the princes might give accounts unto them and uh, the king should have no damage then this daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm so you will find his faithfulness his honesty his integrity and uh, the people of the world should be able to say that about us that in our places of work in our secular employment that we're faithful we have integrity we have honesty and yet our spiritual life will not be lacking look at verse 10 now when daniel knew that the writing was signed he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward jerusalem he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. That means then you find the combination of the secular part and the spiritual part of his life. And everything so combined together effectively that he had a good impact in the world and a good impact in the, amongst the people of God in the church of the living God. Though Daniel was himself a great prophet respected by men by kings by angels and called the beloved by the lord himself yet he was the diligent student of the scriptures he didn't say i know so much myself i've seen so much myself i've heard so much myself and i've got so much revelation myself that i don't need to study the word of god he was a prophet and yet he studied the prophecy of jeremiah whatever we have whatever we know we shouldn't be so proud, we've got so much, we've known so much, we've taught so much. We're not able to listen when other people teach. And we're not able to study when other people are ministering. The greatest and the most favored of the saints of God. And the servants of God must remain diligent students of the word of God. Though Daniel knew by divine predictions that the promised restoration was very close at hand. He still prayed earnestly for that restoration that is god's expectation you see there are some people once they know the promise of god and god says i will do this i will do this i will do that they say well god has said he will and since god said he will what have i got to do with prayer what have i got to do with intercession the lord has decided already that he will do it whether i pray or not it doesn't really matter do you think so daniel did not think so 
He knew that the promise of God was there. And he knew that the restoration of the people of God, the people of Judah, he knew that that was approaching because now they had spent 70 years in the captivity. Yet he prayed. Why did he do that? Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And you'll see the great principle here. At a God that said, I will. I will. And he repeats that I will so many times. And yet, at the end of it, he said, the people of God must pray. If I'm going to do what I said, I will do. Ezekiel chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 9. And I want you to notice in these verses I read the number of times and the situations where the Almighty God said, I will. And then you're going to look at verse 37 later. Look at verse 9. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown. You see that? I will turn unto you. Look at verse 10. And I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it, and the city shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be built. Look at verse 11. I will. You see how many times the Lord is saying, I will, I will. You know, many people will say, well, God said he will do it. He said he'll bless us, he'll save us, he'll sanctify us, he'll fill us with the Holy Ghost, he'll bless us abundantly because he said, I will. Then that said, you'll see, I don't have to pray. No, you still have to pray. Daniel knew that the Lord had said, I will, and yet he still prayed. Verse 11, I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit, and I will settle you after your old estate. And will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord was promising them that better things were yet to come. He said, I will. I'm going to do better things for you right now than in the past. And yet, be near to pray. Look at verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. I will, I will. Many times the Lord said, look at verse 25. And then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. And from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's salvation. The Lord has promised that he will save, he will cleanse, he will transform our lives. It'll change our lives. It'll take all idolatry and all defilement, all filthiness away. And yet we still have to pray. The same thing in your family. It, it wants to save your wife, wants to save your husband, wants to save your children, wants to save your parents. And yet you still have to pray. That's the lesson we're learning from Daniel. That even though he knew that God had determined that the captivity only lasts for 70 years. And yet he now prayed that the Lord will remember his word. Look at verse 26. In your heart also will I give unto you the sanctification, the purity of heart. There's a transplantation of the heart. That he'll take the old Adamic heart away. He'll take the old nature, the stony heart away. He'll give us a fleshly heart, a soft heart, a responding heart, a submissive heart. And yet we still have to pray. He gives us the promise. The promise of salvation in verse 25. And the promise of sanctification, purity of heart in verse 26. And yet the point is we're learning from Daniel. Even though he said, I will, we still must pray. For that experience of sanctification, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. Salvation, 20, verse 25, sanctification, verse 26, and then baptism in the Holy Ghost in verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now look at verse 36 and verse 37. Then the heathen that are left around about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it. What's next? And I will do it. He said, he'll, be, he'll bless us today more than ever before. He says, he'll cleanse us and wash us and purge us 
and purify us and save us. He said he will sanctify us and make us holy in heart, in soul, in mind, internally and externally. He said that he will also baptize us and fill us with the Holy Ghost. And yet he said, I will do it because I have spoken it. Look at verse 37. Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. All these promises have given, and all the things I've said assuredly without any shadow of doubt that I will do. The salvation, the sanctification, the Holy Ghost baptism, everything I said I will do. Yet must you pray, yet you have to pray so that the Lord will fulfill the promise that he said he will do. As we pray, the Lord will fulfill his promises upon our lives in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. We should pray more honestly. When we have the conviction that God is about to display his mighty power in the conversion of sinners and also fulfill his great promises of salvation and Holy Ghost baptism in his church, an assurance that a great revival is to come should lead us to more consecration and to prayer. We're looking at Daniel chapter 9 tonight from verse 1 to verse 19. And we're dividing the uh, message in study tonight to three parts. Number one, personal identification and confession of the nation's sins. Personal identification and confession of the nation's sins. Number two, proper interpretation of their calamities and national suffering. Yes, they suffered. And yes, they had problem and calamity. But uh, Daniel needed to interpret that aright. And whenever something happens to you, you need to have the proper interpretation. Otherwise, your intercession will not be effective. If you accuse God or charge God foolishly, and you do not have the proper interpretation of what is happening to you or happening to the family or happening to the church or happening to the community or to the nation, you'll not be able to intercede well. That's why we have number two, proper interpretation of their calamity and national suffering. Number three, passionate intercession. Passionate and not something indolent or sleepy or sluggish or slumbering over it with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind. He poured his soul out passionately, passionate intercession for compassion and the nation's salvation. I come to number one personal identification with the nation and then the confession of the sins of the nation. We're looking at it from Daniel again, chapter 9, you'll see it said, he set his face in verse 3, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and a sackcloth and ashes. But before that, he had examined the word of God. And he had seen from that examination of the word of God that they were just suspended 70 years in captivity. Where did you see that? It tells us in verse 2, in the first year of Israel. I, Daniel, understood by the books, the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Where did you see that, Daniel? Look at Jeremiah chapter 25. And you will see what, Jer what Daniel had been studying. He had been studying the book of Jeremiah. And he had seen what the Lord had promised. That 70 years captivity will come upon the people of Judah. After that, he will release them from captivity. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, verse 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And this nation shall serve the king of Babylon how many years? 70 years. That's what Daniel saw. That's what Daniel learned. And he took the word of God. Look up for a moment. Now, as you think about Daniel, he didn't spiritualize the word of God. He didn't try to put into allegory the word of God. He said 70 was 70. He didn't say 70. What does that mean? Maybe spiritually. He didn't guess. God said what he made, and he made what he said. And he said, in the captivity of the children of Judah, of the people of Judah, it will be 70 years. And he took the word literally. When you read the word of God, you take everything literally. And as you take it literally, then you understand this is what God said he will do. And he made what he said. 
in verse 12, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, says the Lord, for the iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. We're looking at chapter 29, chapter 29 of Jeremiah, reading from verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, the Lord, that after how many years? 70 years. Very clear. It tells us that when you read the word of God, take the word of God at face value. Believe the word of God. This is what God said he will do. And he has done it. And now 70 years are about over. And that's why he prayed. Again, we're looking at that verse then. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. The Lord was very specific at Babylon. Then he said, I will visit you and perform my good words toward you in causing you to do what? To return to this place. God said, I will. I'll take you out of that place. I'll make you to return. Why then did Daniel pray? Already I read it to you in Ezekiel that even for this that God had said I will do, you still have to pray. Look at what follows immediately, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The expected end is the release and restoration after 70 years of captivity. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. When the Lord gave the promise that was going to release them after 70 years of captivity, then he said, but you must pray. You'll call upon me. And then in verse 13, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. In verse 14, and I will be fond of you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. You will pray with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You'll seek for me early, and then you'll ask for me to deliver you from that captivity. And then the Lord said, I will be found of you, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. And that's the reason why he prayed. And that's the reason why also when you have the promise of God that there's restoration for the backslider. But the restoration is not automatic. We still must pray. There is revival for the church of the living God. But that's not automatic. We still must pray. And there is the outpouring of the blessing of God for the people of God. According to his promises, and yet it's not automatic, the people of God still must pray. And then there must be repentance that joins along with that as well. In Leviticus chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 14. Leviticus chapter 26, and we're looking at verse 14. If they shall confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of their fathers with their, trans with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have what contrary unto me. Here the Lord was very clear and very definite and very specific. That when they go into captivity, when I bring punishment upon them, when I bring some chastisement upon them because of their sin. He said, if they will confess their iniquity, if they will not justify themselves, if they will not gloss over their iniquity, if they will not excuse their immorality, if they will not excuse their idolatry, if they will not give any excuse for the sins they have committed, but they will confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have what contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, if they will not rebel because of the chastisement, because of the punishment, because of the captivity, if they will accept what the Lord has done, and they will know that the Lord is justified in what he has done, and they will seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then the Lord said in verse 42, Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember and will remember the land. That's the condition the Lord had given. 
And that's the condition we need to look at today. If there's any calamity in our lives, any calamity in our families, any calamity in our place of work, anything that is not according to the promised blessing, the Lord said He will bless us. Then we examine our lives. And when we examine our lives, if there's anything to correct, we'll correct. If there's anything to repent of, we'll repent of them. If there's any restitution to make, we'll make that restitution. And we call upon the name of the Lord, standing upon the promises that will never fail. And the Lord will answer our prayers in Jesus' name. In 1 Kings chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 47. 1 Kings chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 47, all through to verse 49. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 47. Yea, if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captive, and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, We have sinned. Isn't that what Daniel was doing? Exactly what Daniel did. Because the word of God had recorded it down that when they are carried captive because of their sin, because of their iniquity, because of their backsliding, because of their righteousness, and then over there they think about what they have done, and they think about the consequence of their evil ways, and they're not trying to blame God, they're not trying to blame anybody, but they know that they are responsible for the actions of their lives, and then they will call upon the name of the Lord and repent and turn from their evil ways. The Lord then said, they must say, we have sinned, and I've done perversely, and I've and have committed wickedness in verse 48, and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies which led them away captive and pray unto thee. It's not just confession. It's not just restitution, and it's just it's not just a sin. Okay, I repent, I turn away from my evil ways. You must also pray and ask for the mercy of the Lord. That's why it says over here, and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul. And in the in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built. For thy name, then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee. And that's uh, what the Lord said, and that's what the Lord wants to do. And as we also apply it to our own lives, and we apply it to our situation, we apply it to our own nation, that's how God forgives, and that's how He brings people back from the deprivations and the problems they have had, so that a new thing will happen. And I pray that that new thing will happen in our lives in Jesus' name. In Ezra chapter 9, Ezra chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 5. Ezra chapter 9. We're looking at it from verse 5. After the people of God have gone into captivity, or they've gone into any problem, the thing to do is to pray. The thing to do is to repent. The thing to do is to return from our evil ways. And we're not just going to remain in that captivity and say, well, when God pleases, he'll take us out of that place. When God pleases, he'll change all the circumstances. When God pleases, he'll look at how we're suffering, and then he will return us from that captivity. No. We'll turn away from our evil. We'll call upon the name of the Lord. We'll make confession and totally make cry it our ways. And then we'll pray to the Lord standing upon the promises of God, fulfilling the conditions he has given. That's how he restores people from captivity. And that's how he restores people from backsliding. That's how the blessings of God will flow. Once again, Ezra chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 5. And at evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness. And having ranged my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And I said, oh my God, I am ashamed and I blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head and our, our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. You see what Ezra did here? That's exactly what Daniel did. They confessed their sins. 
and he said, oh Lord, this is the evil that you have done. And the sins are so many that you cannot even begin to number them. And they have increased and grown even as high as the heavens. In verse 7, since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day for our iniquities. Have we, our, have we and our kings and our princes been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands? To, to the sword and to the captivity and to spoil and to confusion of faith as it is this day. As we read this, we begin to think about how Daniel prayed that they knew the truth and they stood upon the truth. They didn't accuse God for their suffering. They accused themselves. They said, we know why we're suffering. We know why we have the pain. We know why we're in captivity. We know it is because of our sin. Ezra said so. Nehemiah said so. And also Daniel emphasize that in verse 8 and now for a little space grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place and that our, our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage for we were bond men yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage but he has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving and to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O oh, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. They, they, they told the truth. They said, yes, we know what we have done. We're not going to try and sweep, sweep anything under the carpet. We have forsaken your commandment. We have sinned against you. We are contrary unto you. That's why we're going through the harassment of the enemy that we're going through. That's why we're having the problems we're having. In verse 11, which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophet, saying, the land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness now therefore give not your daughters unto their unto their sons neither take their daughters unto your sons nor seek their peace and on all their wealth forever that ye may be strong the lord had commanded them You'll not marry unbelievers. You'll not marry the pagans and the heathens. You'll not marry the people that are not believing and living according to the standards of the word of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Don't give your daughters to them. Don't take their daughters for your sons. Don't marry, don't have an unequal yoke so that you remain strong. They went against that. They disobeyed that. And because of that disobedience, and because of the unequal yoke that came upon them in marriage and making up their families, that's why the calamities came upon them. And eat the goods of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. The Lord was saying, if you will obey my commandments and not get it on equal yoke, you'll eat the good of the land and give the land as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds in verse 13, and for our great trespass sin, that thou our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant, no escaping. O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous. For we have remained yet escaped, as at this day behold, we are before thee in all our, tre in our trespasses. For we cannot stand before thee because of this. So you'll find that Daniel prayed and Ezra prayed and all these people, they prayed. And it's one thing they emphasized. They said they had sinned. 
and because of the sin, those evil things and those sufferings have come upon them. We're looking at Daniel. Look at Daniel now, chapter 9. And see how Daniel was very, very clear, very specific. And then he told the Lord, we know why we're suffering. We know why the calamities come upon us. We know why we're in captivity. It's because we have sinned. Daniel chapter 9, I'm looking at verse 5. Look at verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedness and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Very clear, isn't it? He wasn't trying to beat about the bush or trying to give any excuse. He said, we have sinned. And he said, we have committed iniquity. Look at verse 6. Neither have we our king to thy servants, the prophets, which speak in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. He said, neither have we obeyed you. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, to Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faith, and to our kings, and to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. He repeated that over and over. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Over and over, he identified with the people of the nation. He, he was a righteous man. He was a holy man. He was a sanctified man. But he didn't uh, present his sanctification, holiness, and righteousness before the Lord. He totally, entirely identified, completely identified with the whole nation. And all the time, he said, it's we, it's us, and it's our, our transgression, our sin. It's a national sin. He was confessing. And when you are praying for the nation, that's what you do. You identify with the whole nation. Look at verse 10. Look at verse, uh, verse 11, rather. In verse 11, ye, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, because it is put upon us, and the oath that is reaching in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against thee. Daniel is teaching us how to pray for other people, identify with them. And then you, you, you're able to take their problems and have that on your heart, on your mind, on your shoulders. And you say, yes, it's because we have sinned. When you're praying for your family, you identify with the family. You're not so okay, it's my wife that's, you know, a backslider and, and not actually following the Lord. That's why the family is suffering like this. It's one of the children. It's because, uh, you know, he has an evil spirit, familiar spirit. That's why we're like, I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm sanctified, I am righteous. And this is because of my mother-in-law. It's mother-in-law that is causing all this. No. When you are praying for the family, you identify with the family. We have sinned. We have not done the right thing. We have not followed the word of God. And it is because of our misdeeds and wrongdoing that this is why everything that is coming upon this family and upon this community is coming upon us. Total identification, personal identification and confession of the sin of the nation or the community. Look at verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not a prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, therefore, as the Lord watched over the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we have not, what well, we obeyed not his voice. It's our, it's our fault. We didn't obey the voice of the Lord. Look at verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten this renown, as at this day we have seen and we have done wickedly. And that's what we learn from this a great man of God, that he confessed the sin of the nation and identified with that sin. Daniel approached God with a contrite heart, a humble spirit, as he prayed and interceded for the nation. His prayer was answered speedily because he was focused on God's glory. And he justified God. He exalted God. He said, God, you are righteous. 
God, you are compassionate. God, you are faithful. You are a covenant-keeping God. If there is any fault at all, it's not your fault. It is our fault. Not only that, his prayer was characterized by humility. He didn't say, I'm all right, they are not all right. I'm righteous, they are righteous. I'm saintly, but they are sinful. But he said we. He included himself in that prayer. His prayer was characterized by humility, by unselfishness, by fervency, by passion, by self-denial, and by faith. Now let's see how he interpreted the suffering of the children of Israel. We we'll come to point number two. Proper interpretation of their calamities and national suffering. Proper interpretation of their calamities. And anytime you see Daniel using the word because, 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 it's trying to interpret. It's trying to say we're suffering because of this. When this, because of this. When this calamity and in this problem, because of this that we have done. You must interpret your situation right. If something negative is happening to you, if something negative is happening to your family, if something negative is happening to your local assembly, if something negative is happening to the body of Christ, you must interpret it right and say, this is happening not because God is sleeping, not because God has forgotten, not because God is not faithful, not because God cannot fulfill his promise, but because, because of going against the watch of the Lord. You always lay the blame and the fault at the door of humanity, not at the door of divinity. Let's come to Daniel chapter 9, proper interpretation of their calamities and national suffering. In Daniel chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 11. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, that's the word, therefore, it said, because of our sin. Because of departure from the truth of God and from the doctrine that the Lord himself had laid down because of that, therefore the curse is put upon us. And the oath that is reaching in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because, because, because we have sinned against him. He gave the right reason. That's proper interpretation of the calamities of the people. Verse 12, and he has confirmed his word which he spake against us and against the judges that judge us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven has not been done as it has been done upon Jerusalem. Verse 13, and as it is written in the law of Moses, and all, the, and all, this, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not a prayer before the Lord our God. Daniel said, it's not only that they sinned in the land of Israel, they were stiff-necked, they were stubborn, and they were adamant, and they had in their hearts. And they said, even though all this is came upon us, yet we didn't turn because of that, we didn't repent because of that, and we didn't change our ways because of that, and we saw the calamities coming, and we saw the captivity already in which we are, and we see all the deprivation, all the desolation, destruction that came upon us, and even that did not bend our will, even that did not stop us. We still went on in the things that we're doing. Can't we say that about a backslider? Can't we say that about the people are righteous, that even though when judgment comes upon them, and you will think that immediately that judgment will turn them, will make them to reconsider their lives and reconsider their ways and change, and make them to repent and turn to the Lord. No, they are adamant, and no, they are stiff-necked, and no, they are hardy, no, they remain in their evil until a sevenfold judgment will come upon them again. That's what Daniel is saying in verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet, 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 may we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth in verse 14, therefore, therefore, because we remain rigid, incorrigible, uncontrollable, and we remain in our sin, even though the first stage and the first level of that calamity had come in captivity, and the first captives have been taken to Babylon, and yet the people remaining in the land, they just remained adamant in their evil. Therefore, in verse 14, as the Lord watched over the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord, our God, is righteous in all his works, which he doeth, but we obeyed not his voice. 
Daniel did not charge God foolishly for the nation's calamities and suffering. He knew that God was faithful. He was righteous and merciful, keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. In his intercession for Judah, he said, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. In his intercession, he said, The Lord, our God, be to the Lord our God, belongeth mercies and forgiveness. God is always faithful to his covenant promises when his people keep their part of the covenant. If there is any failure, it does not begin with him. God has committed himself to show favor only while his people are obedient. As a just and righteous God, he cannot encourage evil and sin by bestowing his special blessings on the wicked. When the Lord had said, if somebody is wicked, this is what he will do. The judgment will come upon him. If God then will change and be overpowered by the stubbornness of wicked people. And he says, all right, because uh, they are adamant and because they will not repent. I don't have any choice. I still have to go blessing them. That's going to affect his justice. That's going to affect his holiness. That's going to affect his nature. He cannot do that. And that's why Daniel interpreted Judah's trials and troubles scripturally. He said, therefore the curse is poured upon us because we have sinned against him. If God's people had continued a holy, as a holy people, they would have been high above all the nations of the earth in praise and in name and in, and in honor. They would not have been in captivity under the dominion of any nation. But shame and confusion came upon them because they had sinned and because they had done wickedly. Daniel justified God for all the trouble, for all the suffering, for all the calamity which came upon Judah and upon Israel, upon their kings and upon the people. Their suffering was the penalty, the punishment which their disobedience and wickedness merited, which their disobedience and wickedness deserved. And it was necessary for God to punish the backslidden apostate nation in order to preserve his glory. That's the first sin. In order to preserve his glory, he had to punish them. He had to lay the penalty of their sin upon them. Number two, not only to preserve his glory, but to preserve the honor of his law. And number three, to save his government from contempt. Even men on earth do appreciate governments when they punish evildoers and keep justice, making the world a relatively safe place for us to live in. Angels and saints will justify and praise God throughout eternity for his righteous judgments. And let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, reading from verse 16. You'll see here, here is uh, how God has said uh, what he will do. And so when you see calamity or evil coming upon some people, instead of saying, oh God, what are you doing? Oh God, what are you looking at? Are you sleeping? Look at your people. They're suffering. Well, they may be called the people of God officially, superficially, outwardly. But in their heart, in the secret, in the private, are they really the people of God? Are they living righteously? Are they living a life that is bringing glory to God? Or are they doing some things in secret that you don't know? And because of that, those evil things are coming upon them. Deuteronomy chapter 31, I'm reading from verse 16. In verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and these people will rise up and go a warring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me. God knew that before it even happened. He said, Moses, you are now going. Moses, you are getting old, and as you are getting old, you'll soon leave. But you know these people have been leading, leading them from Egypt and all through the wilderness, going to the land of Canaan. I'm telling you something about these people. I see their heart. I see their tendency. I see their propensity. I see their leanings. They're not stable. They're not solid. They're not totally committed, and they're not eternally committed unto me. And then he told, he told Moses, he said, they will go a warning, they will forsake me and break my covenant, which I made with them in verse 17. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day. And I will forsake them 
and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, and not these evil come upon us, because, because our God is not among us, in verse 18, and I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought, in that, in that they are turned unto other gods. You see what the Lord has said? And the Lord says that, he says that to a nation, he says that to a church. It says that to an individual. Let's say, for example, there is a church that has been standing on the truth of the word of God. And they believe not just in theoretical doctrine, practical doctrine, life-changing doctrine, heart-rendering doctrine, and a kind of doctrine that affects their life. Real salvation, real holiness and sanctification, and real Holy Ghost baptism. And then eventually, as the Lord is blessing them, and they're getting rich, and they're having wives, and they're having children, and they're spreading on this side and spreading on this side, and then they become knowledgeable in this and the things of the world, if eventually they go away from that doctrine of salvation, and from that commitment to holiness and sanctification, and then they go away from the real thing the Lord had said, saying, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And now they become like the people of the world, and they become like what they call Christendom. Like all these people that are kind of filled with churchianity, but no Christianity. And their lives become polluted, their lives become corrupt, and their lives become lukewarm. Then the Lord says, he'll forsake them. It is for a nation, it is for a church. They came in, they possessed the land, and you gave them freely, without any work of their own. You said every place the footstool of your foot shall tread upon, I've given it to you. And you gave it to them, but they were not grateful. And they did not live the life that will honor you and say, thank you for what you have given us. And they did not thank the Lord with a righteous life, a holy life, a, a kind of honest life, with integrity. And that's the interpretation of the whole scripture, that when in calamity comes and falls upon people, we must not look at the reason for that. At the doorstep of other people, we must know that we must examine our lives and find out, have you done something wrong? Have you backsliding? Are you not following after the Lord before that thing happens? It's when you examine yourself and then you turn around and then you repent of your evil ways. Then the blessings of God will begin to flow once again in Jesus' name. We come to point number three. Now, passionate intercession for compassion and the nation's salvation. Passionate intercession for compassion and the nation's salvation. We're looking at Daniel chapter 9, and we're reading now from verse 15. Daniel chapter 9, reading from verse 15. And now, O Lord, our God, that has brought, us, has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt, with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renown, as at this day we have seen and we have done wickedly, O Lord, according to thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and the fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem. It's not pleading for Israel. It's not pleading for Judah. It's pleading for the city of Jerusalem. And it's saying the holy, it's the holy mountain because for our sins and for iniquities of the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people have become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O oh our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. He said, this cannot be for our sake. We have no merit of our own and we have nothing to recommend us for your blessing and for your goodness. This is for your sake, O oh my God. In verse 18, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications because we have our righteousnesses. We don't have any righteousness that we can present before you. 
and say like Hezekiah, I've been walking in a perfect way before you, therefore I will not die. Heal me. We don't have any righteousness. This Daniel said, he said, the nation, the whole nation has gone away from the Lord for thy great mercies. Only because of your mercy, we're pleading and saying, Lord, bring restoration of the blessings of God upon our lives. So, Lord, in verse 19 here, oh Lord, forgive, oh Lord, hearken and do, defile not for thine own sake. Oh my God, it says, do this for your own sake. Do this for your own glory. Do this for your own honor. Do this for your own name. For their own sake, oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. You see, that's how to pray. That, that's how to actually seek the face of the Lord. And you see, that's how, the, how, how Moses also sought the Lord. In the case of Daniel, he was making his request so that the excellent glory of God might be displayed and his glory may be promoted on the earth. That's how all people who pray with true heart. That's the foundation of a desire for the glory of God. That the glory of God will be promoted. And that excellence, the excellence of his character will be displayed. Is then the answer will come. That's why God says, seek ye the Lord. Will you seek the Lord? I said, will you seek the Lord? Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And your righteous man is thoughts. And let him return. Let him return. Let him return. Like the prodigal son. Like the backslider. Like the one who was saved before, but now he's gone back into sin. Like the one who was pure, holy, sanctified before. But now pornography controls his life. Immorality, secret sin, controls his life. It says, return. It is when you return that the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, regeneration, recreation will flow into your life. Return. Don't just remain there in sin because if you die in sin, that will be hellfire forever, for all eternity. But this is the time that we have to say, oh Lord, I examine my life. I examine my heart. I examine myself. I want to follow after the Lord now seeking the glory of God alone. We're looking at Micah. Micah chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 18. Micah chapter 7. And we're looking at verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee? That partners in equity. That's why we have the freedom to come to God. That's why we have the joy to come to God. That's why we have the excitement coming to God. That's why we have the passion coming to God. That's why we have the decision coming to God. Because it's a partnering God. Who is a partnering God like unto thee? That partners in equity and passes by transgression, the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever. If the people will not retain their sin forever, if the people will not remain in backsliding forever, if the people will not remain adamant forever, if the people will not remain hard hearted forever, if the people will not remain in the pleasure of evil forever, he too, he does not retain his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquity and will cast all our, all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform thy truth unto Jacob and thy mercy unto Abraham, which thou hast won unto our fathers from the days of old. As Daniel prayed, the Lord answered immediately. As we pray with the right attitude, with the right mind, and with real repentance, and turning totally to the Lord, immediate answer will come in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up there and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to come. Not like before, not like before. Not just pray like church people pray. Not pray like nominal people pray. But I'm going to pray. You're going to pray with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you're going to pray with all seriousness. You examine your heart, you examine your life, and you find out, how is it with your life? How is it with the relationship with the Lord? I've seen the disposition of Daniel. I've seen the heart rendering of Daniel. I want to have that same disposition, that same condition of heart. I'm calling upon you, O oh Lord. You will hear. O oh Lord, you will hear. Open your heart before the Lord and say, O oh Lord, here I am. 
today, every, everywhere you have gone, that you know it's not pleasing to the Lord Almighty. Why don't you just become very sincere before the Lord, very open before the Lord, and say, Oh Lord, here am I. Oh Lord, here am I. If my people are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. My people who are called by my name, you are called by the name of the Lord, but look at your life. Look at all the dirty things and the secret, and look at all the righteousness. Look at all the wickedness. Look at all the pretense. Look at all the hypocrisy, and look at all the contrary war that you are having against the word of the Lord. Look at your conversation. Look at your talkativeness, and look at the things coming out of your mouth, out of the abundance of the other mouth speaking. And look at your life before the Lord. You used to believe in holiness. Do you believe that today? You used to stand upon sanctification. You stand upon that today. You are separated from the world and the things and the pollutions of the world. Are you still separated from those pollutions of the world today? Are you still the way you were before? When you were saved the first time? When you were sanctified the first time? When you were filled with the Holy Ghost the first time? When you laid everything upon the altar for the first time? When you first knew the Lord? Are you still like that today? Maybe that's why those calamities are coming. Maybe that's why those sicknesses are coming. Maybe you want, you want that's why that, that captivity is there. Maybe that's why the oppression of the enemy. Maybe that's why it's there. Maybe that's why the attacks and the afflictions are there. Why don't you call upon the name of the Lord and say like Daniel, I've examined the book. I've searched the book. I've studied the book. And because I've studied, I've seen the reason for the calamity. I've seen the reason for the captivity. I've seen the reason for the problem. I've seen the reason for the oppression. I've seen the reason for the problems that you have. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, I come today. I come today. Don't take anything for granted. Don't say, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. Only the other people are not all right. Daniel did not talk like that. He identified with the nation. He identified with the nation. Personal identification. And then confession. 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 Look at your family. How's your family? Are you standing on the word of God? Are you shining with the light of the glorious gospel? Are you all holy within and without in that family? Are you the salt of the earth, the light of the world? Are you living by the truth of the knowledge that you, the knowledge of truth that you know? In the private, in the public, a man when you are with a woman and your wife is not there, a woman with a man when your husband is not there. A man, a boy, with a lady, with a girl, when your parents are not there. That's your life. That's your heart. Is everything open? Everything sincere? Everything honest? Everything pure? Everything holy? Everything righteous? The thoughts of your heart. The desires of your heart. The passion within your soul. Are you as righteous as God wants you to be? Do you take the word of God to heart seriously? Like Daniel did, like Jeremiah did, like Moses did. Are you still as passionate as you were before, many years ago, when you first knew the Lord? Are you focused on the Lord? Are you Christ-centered or self-centered? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. The word of God has not changed. And Jesus can come at any time. And even if he tarries, you can die any time. Are you living that life that matches what we learn from the word of God? Are you a new creature in Christ? If any man be in Christ, if any woman be in Christ, it's a new creature, she's a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. All your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Has money become an idol? Any woman an idol in your heart? Any man an idol in your heart? Property an idol? I cleanse you from all your idols. 
you love anything more than God? A woman more than God? A man more than God? A house more than God? Property more than God? That's an idol. And it says, I'll cleanse you from all your idols. From all your filthiness. All your filthiness. All your filthiness, I'll cleanse you. Are you playing with pornography on the internet, on the television? In the print media, inflaming yourself, defiling yourself, that's filthiness. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness. That's what he says. And if we're going to see the face of the Lord on that final day, that's what he wants us to do. Bring everything before the Lord. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves, take away pride, come down from your high, every tower of deception, religiosity, hypocrisy, humble yourself. If my people are called by my name, if they shall humble themselves and seek my face and pray, and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. But we have to turn. We have to repent. We have to throw away all those abominable things. Burn them. Burn them up. All those things that pollute your mind. Corrupt your mind. And let the blood of Jesus wash you whiter than snow. Only then, only then will God cleanse and God forgive and God have mercy and God restore. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the righteous man is thought. Let him return unto the Lord. 